He published over 650 articles in prominent venues such as Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. Dr. Glove's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavioral scientist. Dr. Glove taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. Dr. Gleb is a proud Ukrainian American and lives in Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he spends abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. To help you take advantage of his groundbreaking, groundbreaking expertise, we've asked him to share with us about No Shame, No Guilt, how HR professionals can address discomfort with diversity and inclusion using behavioral science. Now, please give a big round of virtual applause to welcome Dr. Gleb. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Chrissy. All right, everyone. So let's talk about No Shame, No Guilt, how you can address discomfort with diversity inclusion using actually science-based methods. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. Now, the shape of this presentation, just so you can anticipate it, will be, first of all, about some of the errors that people make when they think about and make decisions around other people. So from perspective of diversity, inclusion, and conscious bias, the challenges that occur is because people make bad decisions around other people, especially when tribalism is involved, when diversity, inclusion issues are involved. So I'll talk about the specific mistakes that people tend to make. And then we'll transition from that to identifying and solving these mistakes. So that's going to be the shape of the presentation. That's what you can expect. Without further ado, let's launch into it. Now, I'd like to talk first of all about something different than the workplace diversity inclusion, more judgment and decision-making in general. Now, let's think about driving. Hopefully that's something that many of us do nearly every day. And that's something that it's important to be confident when you're driving. When you're merging into a lane, it's important to be confident to speed up, not slow down, to look and then speed up and then merge into a lane or when you're merging into a highway. It's also important to be confident, to not go kind of creeping slowly, but to go fast, to merge into that traffic. And I'm curious, when you think about yourself as a driver, how confident do you feel in your driving skills? Would you say you're in the top half or in the bottom half of all drivers? So please go ahead and vote. You'll see a poll right now, and please go ahead and vote in that poll, whether you're in the top half or bottom half of all drivers. Okay, I see that most of us voted. Let's give people five more seconds. For those who haven't made their voice heard yet. Now, isn't that nice to see that all of us are in the top half <laughs> of drivers, right? None of us are in the bottom half. Now, that's great for an aspirational world, but we can imagine and realize when we think about it that that's not realistic. Realistically speaking, half of us should be in the top half and half of us should be in the bottom half. But that's not how we think. That's not how we evaluate reality. And so this speaks to our decision-making and judgments in general, in terms of being an above average driver. In a mistake that people tend to make, we all tend to make called the overconfidence bias. The overconfidence bias. We tend to be overly confident, excess, excessively confident about our decision making. So this is a problem. As we can see with you know, the 100% of us being in the top half, that happens in all sorts of situations, not simply in people decisions, which is what diversity inclusion is about, but other decisions. When people say they're 100% confident, they're only right 80% of the time on average. So when you look at research on this topic, and this is especially a problem for people who are more experienced, for those with more authority. So if you've been, if you are in managerial positions in the HR, that would, and you're more experienced, that comes with a certain degree of danger. There was a study done, for example, on doctors. And it found, it gave doctors who were experienced, so 10 years plus out of medical school, and then new doctors who were just out of medical school, a medical case to diagnose and treat. 
and as sample case. And the, they got the diagnosis and treatment right at about the same rate. So recommending diagnosis and treatment about the same rate, but the senior doctors were much more confident about their decisions and therefore less likely to order additional tests to evaluate whether they were right or not. Now, why is that? Well, senior doctors, of course, got the treatment right because of know-how and experience, but the junior doctors had fresher knowledge and experience from medical school. So that's why they got the, the answer correct at about the same rate. And this is really important for us to remember, especially those with more experience and expertise, that the more experience and expertise tends to breed overconfidence. The overconfidence bias is something to really watch out for. And so we need to remember, when I talk about overconfidence, it comes from an emotional place. We saw that all of us are in the top half, right? It feels not very pleasant to think of ourselves more realistically and place ourselves in the bottom half, for, which half of us should have done. <laughs> so we vastly underestimate the role of emotions in our decision-making. And that happens all the time, obviously, in employment settings and leadership settings. That is a serious, serious issue. Because when you look at studies, they show that most of our decision-making comes from emotions. 80 to 90% of our decision-making is emotional. And we just go ahead and make our decisions the way it feels to us, like we should make our decisions without using evidence-based decision-making strategies. So that's a real challenge. That's a serious issue we need to deal with. And that's why it's quite dangerous to go with your gut, to trust our intuitions, to go with our heart, all of those sorts of things that gurus tell us to do. People like Tony Robbins telling us to be primal, be savage, or Malcolm Gladwell telling us to blink, make your decision in the blink of an eye. It feels comfortable, it feels good, but it often leads to disastrous decisions, especially when you make decisions around other people, because our gut is about for the ancient savanna, not the modern world. And so this is the, the crux of the problem, the root of the problem. We are tribal creatures. We've been evolved to be tribal. I mean, think about how we're interacting right now, a small squares on a Zoom screen, right? That's not what we're wired to do. We, are not, we have not yet time to evolve for, the, for it. It's only been available in the last decade. We are intuitively tribal. We are like to be with people who are in a small tribe, of 50 people to 150 people. And in an ancient savannah environment for which we're adapted for, it was really important to be loyal to your own tribal members. Because if you weren't sufficiently loyal, well, the tribal members would kick you out and you'd die. That was a very precarious existence. And you had to be hostile to other tribal members. Because if you weren't sufficiently hostile, the tribe would take you over and you'd die as well. So we are the descendants of those who didn't die. And that's really important to understand that our intuitions are built around tribalism. And that's what we're evolved for. Another dynamic is this fight or flight response to threats, which was great and very important for hunter-gatherers because the risks they faced were immediate, intense in the moment, like saber-toothed tigers. You might have heard of this as the saber-toothed tiger response. But it's a very dangerous response in today's world because the risks we face are much more long-term, uncertain. They might be risks around the kind of people we hire and the relationships we build with them. They might be risks around hearing about a pandemic starting up in the middle of nowhere China, right? That's another type of risks that's much more long-term and uncertain, but which can be much more impactful because we face many less cyber to tigers in today's world. And all of that breeds a series of dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases that come from our evolutionary background and how our brains are wired. So these cognitive biases are what we really want to address. They are, we want to learn about these dangerous judgment errors and try to figure out when they might be impacting us. Like this overconfidence bias. When might we as, when might you as HR professionals feel overconfident when you're trying to make a decision around somebody else? So that's a big serious issue to think about. Now, I want you to think about a poll. We're gonna have another poll. Recall back to a time when you made a bad decision. Real, think about it. Think about all the times you made bad decisions. Was there at least one time when you actually had the information you needed to make a better decision, but you didn't use that information? So please go ahead and vote whether that ever happened to you.
I see over about two thirds of us participate. Five more seconds for those who didn't. Okay, so for the large majority of us, not all of us, that's something that happened. And I know it certainly happened to me. And that feeling when you have the information you need to make a better decision, but you make a bad decision, that really the large likely explanation is that it's a cognitive bias. Because if we were thinking rationally and using the information we had to, if we had the information, we should be making the best decision. But then if you look back and say, oh, I really had the information, I should have made a better decision, that's likely cognitive bias. And the overconfidence bias is just one out of a number of cognitive biases. And so I titled this talk, No Guilt, No Shame, how to make people more comfortable with addressing diversity inclusion. And this is the key to making people more comfortable with addressing diversity issues, inclusion issues, is to show that all of us suffer to some extent from cognitive biases. Like I started with the overconfidence bias, right? And we see that definitely that's a tendency among all of us to suffer from some degree of overconfidence bias. So that is a challenge. Another aspect is this tribal element, that all of us are tribal. We're wired to be tribal. We can work to overcome it, but we're still wired to be tribal. And we need to understand that wiring is key to who we are. We're still wired to have the fight or flight reflex. That's something that's key to us. So to help your staff members be more comfortable with diversity and inclusion, it's really important to tone down anything that might inspire shame or guilt, because those are the emotions. I talked about emotions earlier. If, if those emotions are inspired, you'll just have a backlash from your employees and you the message won't get through. But however, if you approach it from a scientific perspective and you talk about, hey, we all share these errors and that's just a part of the human condition and that's part of human nature to make these errors around tribalism, overconfidence, fight or flight, you know, snap judgments. That's what the, the fight or flight is something that leads to overconfidence because the fight or flight response means you make decisions very quickly. It's, it was important for us to jump at a hundred shadows rather than to miss one saber-toothed tiger. So that is what causes us to be overconfident. We needed to be overconfident in the savannah environment to make our decisions quickly in a very precarious environment. In today's environment, that's a very bad idea. But when we look at, let's say, hiring decisions, we see that intuitively recruiters, hiring managers, they make their decisions within the first couple of minutes of meeting someone. And the rest of the stuff is just justification, which is bad, right? You don't want to do that. You want to use evidence and so on for making your decisions. So bringing this information to the fore, the scientific information, is what's so crucial in helping address the shame and guilt and discomfort with conversations about diversity and inclusion. Okay, so that's kind of the first part that I want you to be thinking about. Now, I'm going to move to another topic, which going into more of some specific examples of these cognitive biases in addition to the overconfidence bias. But first I'm going to answer a question that a number of you might have had. You know, when you first saw me, I look like a normal white stream American male, right? But when I start talking, it's clear I have an accent. So many people want to know where you're from. And that's a question I get asked regularly and I'll be happy to tell you. So I you know, want to tell you about where you're from because it's a question that people often ask in a nice way. It's kind of like, oh, well, you know, I really like your accent. Can you tell me where that's from? That's great. Some people, however, ask that in an off-putting way. So before telling you where I'm from, I'm going to share a story about how to not ask people who have accents about where they're from. So my wife were, and I were driving in Southeast Ohio and we stopped at an, kind of an old timey diner for a break. And so we came in, I asked the hostess for a table for two. And instead of taking us to a table, she said with a skeptical tone, hey, you aren't from around here, are you? Where are you from? Oh, that was not 
great. It was pretty off-putting for me, as you can imagine. So I didn't want to tell her where I'm from. I said, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, which is where I live right now. Uh, she didn't get the hint. She said, well, where were you from before that? And I told her, well, I moved to Columbus, Ohio from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is accurate. And she still didn't get what I was trying to say. And she asked, well, where did you grow up? Well, my I grew up in New York City. That's where my parents came when I was a kid. So I told her, that's where I grew up. I grew up in New York City. And she really refused to get the message. She said, but that accent isn't American. Where is that from? And finally, I told, just told her, you know, if you want to take a guess, go ahead and guess. And at that point, she stopped and she took us to a table. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a classic example of microaggression. It's a message that someone is an outsider, that they aren't welcome. The message is communicated implicitly without necessarily intending to do so. I can't read her mind whether she intended to do so. But the outcome is pretty clear. I mean, some people do it unintentionally, some people do it more intentionally, but the outcome is pretty clear. So you want to watch out for any kind of microaggressions that you might inadvertently communicate to others because they might be something that people don't intend to communicate, but something that comes through. And that again happens due to this tribalism dynamic that people might implicitly without realizing it, communicate and commit microaggressions. So that's something to watch out. And talking about how to help people feel less shame, less guilt, feel more comfort is to share stories like this that you experienced or others experienced that are based on this tribalism. So first talking about the science and then talking about what are some of the examples with how it pans out in real life. All right, so let's talk, share you about where I'm from. So I'm from a small country called Moldova. As uh, Chrissy mentioned, my dad is Ukrainian, my mom is Moldovan, so my heritage is Ukrainian. And they grew up in this country. When you see Moldova is right by Ukraine, I spent my summers in Ukraine, still have relatives there. So definitely a very tough situation that's going on there right now. Fortunately, my parents moved to the United States when I was a kid, when I was 10. And I grew up in the United States, definitely something that I really <laughs> appreciated. They, they came to the United States, especially in, they moved to the United States in 1991. I was 10, so obviously I moved with them. And I especially appreciated that they moved in 1996 when there was a world value survey that came out that showed that Moldova was the least happy country in the world of the one survey. I have no idea why, but <laughs> I, that made me especially glad. Now, my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. I grew up in New York City, so obviously, you know, in the, you know it's a cultural melting pot. It's something that, you know, you hear a dozen accents, you, you go block, you hear a dozen accents. So I chose not to drop my accent. And like other people who grew up in more, less homo more homogeneous areas, like Columbus, Ohio, where I'm living right now, people chose to drop their accent. But I didn't. And once I was went to get my PhD and I was studying at UNC Chapel Hill to get my PhD, I realized that was kind of a dumb decision because of a tendency called accent discrimination. So accent discrimination is a false perception of those with other accents being less trustworthy, less trustworthy. And so this relates to a dynamic called the halo effect and the horns effect. The halo effect and the horns effect. So the horns effect refers to somebody having little horns in their head. If you dislike one characteristic of someone, usually because it indicates that they're not from your tribe, that they're part of a different tribe, they're different from you, you'll have two negative view of their other characteristics. For example, if someone has a different accent, that not everyone, but most people will have a negative view of those who have different accents than they do. The halo effect, if someone how it's kind of like a little halo on your head. If you like one characteristic, then you'll have two positive view of other characteristics. So for example, if you're both, if you're from the South and if you meet and you have a Southern accent and you meet somebody else who has a Southern accent, you will tend to like that person or somebody who has the same value set, religion, politics, all of these sorts of things. It's especially dangerous for business relationships of all sorts. You see this kind of going on with teamwork, for example, within a company, it can cause a lot of problems where there are internal teams 
let's say, people within the operations department who are loyal to other people within the operations department, but they're hostile to people in the sales department. And people in the sales department form their own team, their own tribe. So you have this internal tribes who are friendly toward each other and hostile toward other parts of the company. That definitely happens. So that's a problem to watch out for. And it's a problem, of course, in hiring and promotion. And I'll give you an example of this. So this is from a keynote, my closing keynote at to Hroko, which is the Human Resources Association of Central Ohio. So it's the main, it's a Sherman group for Central Ohio. And I was doing this presentation at the 2018 Diversity Inclusion Conference for Central Ohio. So, so this is the closing keynote. There are over 100 HR leaders in the room. Now, if you know anything about Central Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, you'll probably know that it's the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. It's a big football team in town. It's something that people are really fans of, so go Bucks. And our big rivals is the University of Michigan Wolverines. So unfortunately, we lost to them this year, hope, last year. Hopefully, we'll beat them this year. Now, I was asking in this presentation for Central Ohio whether anyone would hire a University of Michigan fan. So would people in the room who tend to be Buckeye fans, would they hire a University of Michigan fan? Let's see what happens. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? Hey, oh, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, three people. So only three people would hire a Michigan fan. Let's see, I will give them a chance to change their mind. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> so I gave them a chance to change their mind, but as you see, they were not willing to change their mind. And so that's over 100 people, and only three would be willing to hire a University of Michigan fan. And that's about sports fandom. So it's a kind of a pretty, something that's obviously insignificant for your work. But think about all the other things where people, where it's much, much more significant for your work. And people still make these pretty bad decisions where if you're making such a decision about something as insignificant as football fandom, think about things like religion, ethnicity, race, politics, all of these sorts of things, ability, disability. These are serious, serious problems. So the halo effect and the horns effect, I want to check whether you think it would be valuable to address the halo effect and the horns effect in your organization. So please go ahead and vote whether you think that that would be valuable to address based on what you know now. Okay, good. I see we're mostly voted. Let's give five more seconds to those who didn't yet. Oh, perfect, all of us. Great, so we see that just over half of you think it's highly valuable, that's excellent. So you take this information, bring it back to your workplace. Those who think it's moderately valuable, consider where it might be applied. Let's see. All right, let's talk about another example of a cognitive bias. The optimism bias and the pessimism bias. And the, so these are kind of like it sounds, the optimism bias is people who have a very positive view of the future who are risk blind, in other words. This is people who are opportunity oriented, entrepreneurial and creative, but their challenge is that they're too risk blind. So that's kind of, I'm pretty optimistic. So by the way, this is not kind of a binary, this is a range. So you can be moderately optimistic, moderately pessimistic, strongly optimistic, strongly pessimistic, extremely optimistic, extremely pessimistic. I tend to be strongly optimistic, which means that I tend to see the grass as green on the other side of the hill. I tend to see the glass as half full that I tend to see the world as full of opportunities, but I tend to miss and ignore threats. The pessimism bias is the opposite. It's people who are great at noticing and managing threats, at stabilizing situations, at being an improver. 
but they tend to be too risk averse. So these are people who see the glass as half empty, the grass as yellow on the other side of the hill. And again, you can be moderately, strongly, or extremely pessimistic. So that depends. And an interesting dynamic is that I'm strongly optimistic and my wife tends to be strongly pessimistic. So that was created a lot of challenges in the beginning of our relationship for, when we had a lot of arguments and confusion and conflicts based on this. For example, I really like surprises. That's something I really enjoy and it's something I you know, tell people and that's something that, that's really fun for me. And my wife tends to be anxious about surprises. And so when I surprised her early in our relationship, that caused her a lot of anxiety. And that was a very confusing for me because viscerally, my gut intuitions told me that everyone likes surprises. They're great. <laughs> and so that is something that I had to learn that, no, this is people who are pessimistic tend to not like surprises. And so that feeling of pessimism comes from a place of more worry and anxiety. And that is something to really respect and understand. So you, it's really good to have two of each on your team two optimists and two pessimists. So two of each on your team. So if you have two optimists, then the rest can be pessimists, depending on the organization. If you have two pessimists, the rest can be optimists. Again, you know, if you have a creative team, marketing team, you probably want mostly optimistic, and but at least two pessimists. If you have mostly, let's say, a team of auditors, you want mostly pessimistic, but two optimists. Because the Optimists are really helpful to generate ideas, creative ideas, innovative ideas, figure out problem solving, how to address problems in creative, out of the box ways. Pessimists are really helpful for figuring out how to address the problems with the, all the ideas that optimists create. You know, like I said, I'm optimistic, so I have 20 ideas before breakfast, and it feels like they're all brilliant. And I had to learn to my bitter chagrin that they're not all brilliant. So I make sure in the company that I run, disaster avoidance experts, the consulting company on bias and addressing cognitive biases, to actually make sure to hire some pessimists. So I give my 20 brilliant ideas to some pessimists, to a pessimist, and they evaluate those and they say, well, these are all half-baked potatoes, but maybe these three are worth finishing baking. So they're great at figuring out what ideas are effective and improving them, stabilizing them, and implementing them. That's their strength. So that's why I need both on your team. Now, thinking about optimism and pessimism, how valuable do you think it would be to figure out and address any of the problems that might come from the optimism bias and the pessimism bias in your organization? Please go ahead and vote. That nine tenths of the people participating, five more seconds. Okay, just about the same, just a tiny bit less popular than the halo effect and the horns effect. So great. So if you think it's highly valuable, again, it's up to you to go ahead and take it in to your organization and implement things. All right. So how can you, we're moving into the other part of the presentation after identifying the, some of the cognitive biases, learning about them. And again, this is all when you talk to people about how to address shame and guilt and to address discomfort, talking about these cognitive biases, how we all suffer from them to some extent or other, and how just the science shows that that's something that we're born with, you know, looking at the evolutionary psychology. So, and the cognitive neuroscience and making sure that people understand that it's just something that's an inherent part of our brain. The thing is we can address them. So we can take steps to address them. We can't change intuitively how we feel those feelings. What we can change is our behavior. So we can notice that those feelings are there, but we can choose not to trust our gut, to not follow our intuition, to not go with our heart, whatever other phraseology you would choose, to not be overconfident, to not fall into the halo effect or the horns effect, to not simply, if we're optimists, to say that pessimists are bad, or for pessimists to say that, you know, for optimists to say that pessimists are just, you know, Mr. No, and if we're pessimists to say that optimists just shoot from the hip, 
no, we need both of each type of people. Those are both strengths and we need to figure out how to play to each person's strength. So figuring out how to overcome the dangerous judgment errors is the key for you as HR professionals. So you need to go against your own intuitions and you need to teach people to go against their intuitions. Our intuitions were great for helping humans survive. In that early savanna environment, it was very important to be tribal. It was very important to have the fight or flight reflex, but that's not great in today's world. We have many, many less survival situations. We need, it's much, much better for us to take more time and examine the situation before making a decision. We also are living in a complex, multipolar, global world where tribalism is not really going to cause it to help us make good decisions. And I'll give you some other examples where people already made, figured out how to address some problems that come from our gut intuitions. A big one is food. So let's say, think about, you go to the workplace, if you're working in the office and a grateful vendor sent over a box of donuts. It's very tempting, you know, you go back to that box of donuts and it's very tempting to take half a donut. And then you're kind of turned on and you take the other half of the donut. And then if you're really tempted, you take another donut and the third donut. And before you know it, half the box is gone. <laughs> Not that it ever happened to me. Now, that having donuts, why do we get turned on? Well, because in the savanna environment, it was very important for us to have as much sugar as possible when we came across a source of sugar, like honey, bananas, apples, all of those sorts of things. So it's very important for us to have that sugar. In the modern world, that's a very big problem. Companies exploit that to cause us to eat a lot of processed food, right? Like donuts, that's not a good idea. Instead, it's much better to come up with alternative techniques. For example, going, passing by those donuts that somebody sent over and going by a bowl and going and taking a peach or an apple from a bowl of fruit that another grateful vendor sent over who actually cares about their health. So you've probably developed some techniques to address these problems when the challenges associated with modern processed foods in your own health, whether that's, let's say, going exercising, diet, whatever you're doing. So you figured out how to address those gut impulses around processed food, at least to some extent. Not everybody does. There's a reason this country still has an epidemic of obesity. But there's still, there's many people have figured out how to address these problems. And you need to think about this physical fitness. So you've worked to address your physical fitness. In the same way, we need to work to address our mental fitness. And addressing these cognitive biases is the way we address our mental fitness. So that's the key. That's the approach you want to take in helping people make good decisions and helping them have less shame, less guilt, and less discomfort when talking about the when talking about diversity and inclusion. Okay, let's talk about how to identify these cognitive biases within your organization. And a very good tool is an assessment on dangerous errors in the workplace. It focuses on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases, evaluates their extent and impact, and provides the steps you need to address them. So let me share with you the assessment. You should all be able to see the assessment. And so the directions tell you that each question refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. Your goal is to indicate how often the problem occurred in your workplace in the last year, in percentage terms out of all the times it might have occurred. So you can do this, you can limit it to a specific unit, you can limit it to, you can do it for the whole organization, whatever you want to focus on, it's, it's fine. So right now, just think about your specific workplace where you work, you can decide whether you want to make it your business unit, your whole organization, depending on the size of your organization. And we're gonna answer some questions. And so you want to open up your chat because we'll be using the chat function. Now, when you give the answer, don't overthink it. Just go with your initial impressions. Each question should take you 10, 15, 20 seconds. Uh, let's see. When the potential or current employee was, was evaluated, in what percentage of the situations was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or, over, or organizational fit? So in the chat, just put a percentage for that question. Please go ahead. So use the chat, put the percentage.
Mm -hmm. 5%, 20% from Carolyn. Please go ahead, others. 10%, 50%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 25%, 25%, 20%, 25%. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So Go ahead and share more. Now, if it's something in the five to ten percent range, it's not a too much of a problem. Kind of it happens. If it begins to get over ten percent on this question or other questions, it becomes again becomes more of a serious issue. And if it become gets over twenty percent, of course, it's a becomes a really serious issue because then you are systematically the organization is systematically making mistakes on evaluation. And this question has to do with the halo effect. So you can see that you don't have to know what the halo effect is to take this assessment. Let's do another one, number four. So let's talk about focusing on people decisions. Of all situations when someone had evidence that would contradict their beliefs around a person, so we're talking about diversity, inclusion, people decisions, or clear information that would disprove their interpretation of the situation, in what percentage of the cases did they ignore the evidence or misinterpret the information. Please go ahead and vote. 15 percent, 25%, 10%, 5%, 25%, 5%, 10%, 33%, 10%, 20, 30%. So yes, yeah, so same idea where you definitely don't want, if you're noticing that you're getting over 10% on this, this is when you want to focus on this question. So this one has to do with the halo effect. And this one has to do with a cognitive bias called the confirmation bias, where we look for information that confirms our beliefs and reject information that doesn't. And let's do one more. Of all significant decisions around, again, other people, in what percentage of cases was someone overconfident about their decision? So this, of course, has to do with the overconfidence bias when we remember that from the beginning. Please go ahead and vote. 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 
address that and you might be making assumptions about them being you know mr no when in reality they are coming from a place of anxiety and fear and they are trying to prevent a situation they perceive as bad from coming around what would a trust and objective advisor suggest i do so think about an angel on your shoulder what would that angel suggest you do what would you tell someone in this situation you know how would you advise them to make a better decision you get 50 percent of the benefit of this question just by asking it and of course you get the other 50 percent of the benefit by calling someone or emailing or texting a trusted advisor whether someone in your sherm group like your peers here whether you have someone who's a mentor in your organization whether an external coach or consultant asking them for advice is very helpful so these three questions, the first three, are to help you make the decision, then about implementing it. Now, because if you make the decision well, but you don't implement it well, you're not really going to end in a good place. So fourth, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So when you're assessing someone for promotion, for evaluation, how can you have a, you addressed all the ways this could fail? Maybe you haven't considered some dynamics that would be in place. Maybe you haven't considered some alliances or maybe you haven't considered all the places that they would be good to work in your organization and haven't thought about that maybe they can be shifted to a different place. There are lots of things that you can consider around people issues, around interpretations of the situation. And finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to revisit your initial impression? Or what would cause you to revisit the new hire you just made? What would cause you to revisit the promotion? Well, maybe you decide to have a training course. What would cause you to evaluate whether the training course is effective or not? So what new information will cause you to revisit this decision? This is a really useful technique for you to do as an individual. It, once you learn how to do it, it only takes a couple of minutes. And it's also very helpful for a team decision. So you just structure a team decision. Let's say you're a hiring committee and you're making a decision on the hires. You're coming to the final the final three candidates, I need to make a decision. And you struck, you can structure your agenda of the meeting around these five questions. And then just go for these five questions and you can be pretty confident that the answer you get at the end of the five questions, well, you'll not only select the candidate well, but you'll also help onboard that person well because you look at how you addressed all the ways that this hire can fail, what new information would you need to revisit this decision? Maybe you decide that you know, we'll, have a 360 evaluation for this candidate in three months and see how they're doing and see if they, we have certain success indicators, that they meet their KPIs and so on during that period. So there are a number of ways of addressing it. This is just for a hire. You can do anything for new policy or you're selecting new insurance or something like that. Very valuable. Now, thinking about this technique, how valuable do you think it would be to make to good enough decisions using these five questions to avoid decision disasters. Please go ahead and vote. Okay, I see 75% of us participated. Let's give five more seconds. Okay, clearly a pretty popular technique. Just about two thirds of you find it valuable. That's excellent. I'll send your decision aid, which you can use to share, use it for yourself and share it with your HR team, with your line managers and so on. Great. So we're coming to the end. Just the key takeaways for you to remember. The tribalism causes us to favor those in our in-group without realizing it. And by communicating this message, that's something you can address the shame and guilt and discomfort. And you need to teach people, train them to not trust their guilt, on not trust their gut on people decisions where they don't want to screw up because it's very easy for us to screw up on people decisions. Use the assessment for yourself and for others in your organization to learn about and address cognitive biases and the five questions to make good enough decisions around people quickly and effectively, efficiently and effectively. Now, the free additional resources, you don't need to go to the time. If you're watching this as a recording after the presentation, 
go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. So if you're watching this as a recording after this presentation, go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. The rest of you will have a poll to opt into the resources. There's a coaching session. I have three slots open. So it's going to be a first come first serve situation. A copy of my best-selling book, The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias, Build Better Relationships. Then decision aid for the five questions and the assessment. All right. So you'll see a poll. Please go ahead and vote on that. And in the meantime, I'll be happy to take any questions. You can unmute yourself or you can use the chat, whatever is more convenient for you. You had a lot of um, good information. I was wondering, and, and sorry, I was I had to meet with somebody right in the middle, but um, so I didn't have your full attention the whole time. But um, maybe you could go over some examples, like um, how you yourself utilize some of these techniques. Maybe in particular, the sure five questions or yeah, you know. I'll. So the techniques do you mean the cognitive biases or the five questions? Which which ones are you talking about? Um, either one would be sure. I'll I'll be happy. To. So <laughs> something that I often see when I come into an organization, let's say to address team conflict, is that there's a lot of butting heads between optimists and pessimists. So optimists tend to just come up, with, generate a lot of ideas. They're the people who say, "Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do that," and the pessimists feel they have a lot of a position and they say no let's not do that that's a bad idea no that that's a problem and it results in a lot of conflict and stress which when you look at the situation what i help people realize when they're on their start to understand so i do personality assessment help them understand okay you're more optimistic you're more pessimistic then if you're more optimistic you'll tend to generate ideas but your ideas are not going to be nearly as good as you feel they are <laughs> so I told you kind of the 20 ideas before breakfast and they feel like they're all brilliant. Your ideas are not going to be nearly as good as they are because you tend to be risk blind and you not see the threats and the problems. Pessimists will see a lot exaggerated threats and problems in each idea. They're bad at generating ideas on, on average because they see lots of flaws in each idea. So it takes them a lot of time to think through an idea to make sure it's as perfect as possible before they share. That's generally tends to be how pessimists generate ideas. So they're not really good. So when you're thinking about brainstorming, it's not really a good idea for pessimists to participate in that first part of the brainstorming session where you generate a lot of ideas because they tend to feel a lot of anxiety and a lot of pressure of, to generate ideas, which they have trouble doing. They feel a lot of anxiety about the optimist generating ideas that have lots of, that they see as harebrained ideas, have big potatoes. So it's much more helpful for the optimist to generate ideas and then pass them on to pessimists, for pessimists to evaluate the ideas and see, like I gave the ideas to my team member who is a pessimist who I trust and look at these and say, well, these are you know, half-baked potatoes, but maybe these three are worth finishing baking. So I help work teams work together to make sure that optimists know that they need to let go of their ideas. It's a very hard thing for optimists to do, to let go of the idea that you generated. But you need to learn that your idea feels much better internally than it actually is. And some of your ideas will be great, but maybe it's one out of 10, not like you know 10 out of 10. So you need to let go of those ideas and you need to give them to the pessimists and trust the pessimists will see and evaluate them and figure out how to implement them effectively, because that's the strength of the pessimists, how to evaluate the ideas, how to manage them, and how to implement them. So having that division where, again, you need at least two on each team, that has really helped teams. So coming into organization and helping think about team structure, who belongs in what team, and then how do the teams play together well so they don't butt heads nearly as much and they actually work together much more effectively. There's much less conflict, more engagement, people are happier. 
So that's an, that's an example of just using that one technique. Thank you very much. Sure. Now, with the assessment, I'll give you an example of this. The assessment I usually use as a needs analysis. So looking at going to an organization, the, one of the first things I would do is I would have all the leaders and managers, people in organizational development, HR, take the assessment and see what they identify as the biggest problem in their organization. And then once we talk about, okay, here are the biggest problems, you know, these three cognitive biases were identified as the biggest ones, let's see where they manifest in your organization. And so we look at the specific instances where they come up and then we take steps to address them based on their specific manifestation. So that's another way to use the assessment. Other folks, unmute yourself or ask in the chat. Five more seconds for those who still wish to ask something. All right, I think we're good. Excellent. Hope you all had a good morning. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Glove, for speaking with our um, chapter today. I look forward to hopefully seeing everyone next month. Again, February 28th, you have the option of joining us virtually or in person at Dove Point, and that invitation will be coming out to you shortly. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You're welcome, Jim. You're welcome, Kimberly. <laughs>